Padre Cigarettes, that smooth, mild flavor that helps you do the people's business, be a patriot with every puff, and enjoy Cadre Cigarettes, sponsors of the committee program. Live from West Berlin, it's the committee program's fourth annual Bastille Day Spectacular with a run Chowdhury, Julia Doubleday, Forrest Lovett, Fiamma Melli, Jevat Castotti, and yours truly, Jacopo Castelletti. We now join the show already in progress. In 1787, Versailles, for all its splendor, was becoming a relic of past glories. While Frenchmen were gripped by a new age of learning, Versailles and those who lived here represented a backward-looking society where birth outweighed ability. Versailles stood also for the extravagance of French kings, from Louis XIV to the present Louis XVI. The richness they created drained their treasuries. The American War of Independence, to which France contributed not only revolutionary ideas, but arms, money, and men, had proven a crushing burden on the royal wealth. But the Hall of Mirrors seemed to reflect the image of a stable monarchy, assured of its power. A deceptive image. France was impatient for something new. Welcome to the committee program, sponsored by Cadre Cigarettes. Be a patriot with every puff and a self-critical citizen. Cadre and you, perfect for equatorial Fredonia. And with that, and with that final move, I have actually finished our contra- contractual obligation to the equatorial, uh, the nation of equatorial Fredonia. And that's actually the last sponsored episode we have from that particular sponsor. Thank you to everyone involved. Look, welcome back to your committee program. I am your host, Arun Chaudhry, and this is our final episode of the season. It is the Bastille Day Spectacular. Uh, we had one last year, so you know what to expect. In fact, we will be rerunning one of the segments from that with uh, Mathilde Rare, which is my favorite segment we've ever done, and it's worth looking at again. But we have plenty of new stuff to enjoy today. Jacopo Castelletti will be back with the Global News Rodeo, as well as the Polling Channel. I will be speaking with Sam Moore, the author of The Rise of Ecofascism, about ecofascism. Uh, and we will also uh, delve in to this, what we were just watching a bit, right, which is the Encyclopedia Britannica's, you know, 1966 um, history of the French Revolution. And I just think it's interesting to think about the communications sort of propaganda aspects of encyclopedias, right? It's almost like slow food, right? Now it's all quick, zap, can I do this virally? The idea of the encyclopedia as propaganda is to instill a complete system at once that even if you don't know what everything is, uh, everything that you do know can be categorized inside that system. It's neither a left nor right thing. I mean, think we would be watching this. This is obviously a Burkean, a British uh, view of what the French Revolution was, could be, and could mean. But that's not, but that's not the point, right? Actually, during the lead-up to the French Revolution, the, the publication of the original encyclopedia was you know, a major political uh, and cultural event, mostly for the left wing <clears throat> inside that kind of Enlightenment ideal. You had articles by Voltaire, you had articles by you know, Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> uh, speaking of the slaveholding class, and uh, Diderot. Diderot, who I just did want to mention because this is the Bastille Day episode. And uh, not only was he an important author of many, many and, you know, kind of ringleader of the encyclopedia, uh, but also he is the author of my favorite quote from the French Revolution, which is, of course, when we strangled the last priest with the gusts of the last king. No other way around. When we strangle the last king with the guts of the last priest, we will finally be free. Call me old fashioned. It's just still where I come down on the issue. 
Let's roll. And welcome back to the Global News Rodeo. This is Jacopo Castelletti filling in for Ron Chaudhry, who... No, I, I just asked him. I just asked him if he wanted me to do that, and he just went, okay, so here I am, and it's, it's 34 degrees outside. I can't wait to get this off. Tonight's sub story in item number one the sausage king of Chicago? No, the cocaine king of Milan. Drug kick pin escape specialist and all around all star criminal Rocco Morabito, one of the most wanted men in Italy, has arrived in Rome to serve a 35 year prison sentence for trafficking. The 55 year old cocaine king of Milan was arrested last May in an operation conducted by Brazilian and Italian police. Morabito was the critical link between South American drug producers and users all over Italy as a member of the Drangheta, the, criminal, the sprawling criminal network which controls much of the cocaine trafficking in Italy and beyond. Item number two, Mumbai monsoons. This monsoon season will be especially fierce as the normally and naturally persistent rains are transformed into climate events. Millions have slodged through work through waist deep water as India's financial capital is disrupted. It's that time of the year again where heavy rains in the Indian city of Mumbai and nearby areas have disrupted the lives of millions of people in the country's financial capital, which is already prone to uneven construction and traffic snarls. Climate changes our environment, but we don't change. Item number three, South African tragedy. 21 teenagers died under mysterious circumstances in a nightclub in South Africa last week. A funeral with 19 empty coffins was attended by thousands, including South Africa's president, Cyril Ramaphosa. The deaths, which occurred 10 days ago, initially had been reported as a potential trampling incident. But toxicology reports have concluded their deaths were caused by something ingested or inhaled. Unregulated alcohol and grey markets drugs are a huge cause of accidental and deliberate death worldwide. Many puritanical attempts to regulate intoxicants lead to a market for such deadly goods. And last but not least, another flawed story, item number four. Simply because climate change continues to be the most unreported event, we will devote another segment to it. And still, this will not be enough. 50,000 people are being told to leave their homes in parts of Sydney's where eight months of rain have fallen in just four days. This is the third set of floods hit that in Australia's largest city this year. Thousands have been left without power, many roads are impossible, and houses are underwater. La Nina weather pattern and climate extreme weather has killed more than 20 people this year, many of them in New, Th in New South Wales. Let us be clear, these are victims of climate change and continue energy use as we know it. And that was everything for tonight. Thanks for tuning here at the Global News Rodeo and now the polling channel. By me. Again. Ciao and welcome back to our polling update here at the polling channel brought to you by the committee program. Elections to the Estates General were ordered.
May 1789, after months of preparation, the estates met in Versailles with an opening procession of the three orders. Here were the nobles whose resistance to royal taxation had brought about the meeting. Also in gold-trimmed robes, the clergy, mostly from the church's own nobility. But by now, the center of hopes for a constitution to limit the king's power had shifted to the third estate, the commoners, dressed by government order in modest black, but already on its way to becoming a potent political force. Of the reluctant hosts to this assembly, an American tourist who watched the procession wrote in his diary, neither the king nor queen appear too well pleased. As the estates began their sessions, the commoners outnumbered nobles and clergy. To keep them in check, the king and his ministers tried to rig the voting, so the upper two estates, clergy and nobility, would have control, as had always been the custom. No, said the third, and for more than a month refused to budge. It was forced into action when Louis had it locked out of its meeting hall. The members moved to a nearby indoor tennis court. A dominating figure was a member named Mirabeau, who was soon to defy royal authority. When a court messenger hinted of force, the bull-voiced Mirabeau answered for them all, we are here by the will of the people and can be removed only by force of bayonets. Hi, and welcome back to the committee program. I hope you are enjoying your slightly turgid uh, updates from the Encyclopedia Britannica film department on the French Revolution, but more importantly, I hope you're enjoying the global news updates and smart segments that you have come to rely on your committee program for. And uh, actually, during 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 that last segment, I got a call from the folks at Cadre, and they actually said that actually we hadn't totally finished our obligations, so just one last time, uh, here we go. Fully packed, fully flavored, fully ideological Cadre cigarettes and you perfect together and perfect for the next five-year plan for equatorial Fredonia. And with that, I actually think that that we're pretty good. And now, Smart Club. Hi, and welcome back to the committee program and our final Smart Club for the season. This is the last helicopter out of Saigon, and we would have been remiss in not reserving a place for Sam Moore, fan favorite friend of the show, uh, who came on almost a year ago, a little less, a couple months less. Last year, talk us about eco-fascism, and this time we were talking about the same subject, especially in relationship uh, to a book that he co-authored. Co-authored. I said co-authored. Co-authored which is The Rise of Ecofascism, Climate Change in the Far Right, available from Polity Books. They don't always respond very quickly to shows who need copies of it, but we respect them and the work that they're doing. And it's a hard gig out there in publishing these days. And we respect Absolutely. that. Sam, hello. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I'm very glad to be here. That was glad a big wind up. It was a big yeah. wind up. No, I was really excited to get it. And I was really excited to, to talk about it. And it's very funny. Um, I, when talking to our co-host on the show, Julia Doubleday, I often drip with contempt at things that I say are, if she's reading a book that I say is about current events, uh, I, you know, I immediately drip with contempt. I'm like, you know, either it's an article or it's a book, this other thing that's sort of in between, and, you know, and part of me worried would a book on ecofascism, which is of course a trendy term, like be a book about current events. And that's not the book that you have made. Your book starts out all the way at the beginning and goes all the way uh, through the present, which is what I thought was so cool about it, especially in terms of our discussion last time, which was so specifically about how this kind of confluence of individualism inside of the wellness community mm -hmm. and skepticism and government of government and conspiracy had kind of lent itself to maybe co-opting co by the right and the far right. One of your yep. main points was, yes, maybe, but also you have to understand this is a fraud and no one actually cares. You know, uh, the, all think that was well taken and I think we'll get there again. But I wanted to do you the service of letting you frame the argument in the way that your book does by starting at the beginning. 
uh, or near the beginning, because you start all the way up. We're going to take one step forward. And I think it will be very <laughs> interesting to hear you talk about kind of the origins of honest to goodness kind of uh, right wing ecologism uh, mm. and conservatism, um, especially in terms of colonialism at first. In your book, I was very struck by by this argument. So if we could start there. Well, totally. So, I mean, there's a, of course, a famous line um, uh, from kind of critical theorists, early critical theorists, um, in which they say, um, it's Horkheimer, who says that if you don't want to talk about fascism, then you should avoid talking about uh, capitalism. And then someone else who's now temporarily forgotten, Tara uh, Dari, rejoins that if you don't want to talk about fascism, you shouldn't want, you shouldn't talk, sorry, if you don't want to talk about colonialism, you shouldn't talk about fascism either. I think this is completely true. Um, people often talk about like, left wing and right wing as products of the French Revolution, uh, you know, sitting on the, the left side and sitting on the right side of the chamber. It's absolutely true. Um, and left and right are, of course, kind of positions on the French Revolution in some sense, but they're also positions on the management of empire, right? They're also positions in this kind of global, uh, you know, more expansive context outside of uh, France. And so when we're thinking about what we call in the book, far right ecologism, we're thinking about the ways in which nature becomes a problem for imperial management. Um, it becomes a collection of decisions that empires have to make about how they relate between various different things, right? Who they are as the, the conquering, uh, often sometimes settling mm -hmm. imperialists, who the people who were there before are, and what this kind of natural environment that they are living in is for. So of course, the function economically of lots of uh, colonies in uh, kind of 18th and 19th century empires is that they essentially um goods for um like bringing back to the uh the main um yeah, the main country um famously of course there is a the triangular circulation mm -hmm. right uh or between um uh, europe west africa where people are enslaved and taken to uh the us and the caribbean and then people uh and then cotton which is just brought back to um brought back to, to, to europe and so there's, there's the kind of triangular circulation and so what these things are what the kind of the nature that colonists find in these distant far-flung places um first of all it's very strange to them and second of all it's it's full of people um and so these people have to be put in their place these people have to be organized into systems such that we can justify colonists can justify their enslavement their extermination you know whatever it is that colonists need to justify mm -hmm. to carry out the kind of the project of of um producing a viable economic relationship out of, out of colonialism and so in that context, we get the first instances of what we term far right ecologism. Um, they're principally concerned with things like establishing, as I said before, kind of racial hierarchies. Uh, sometimes there are four races in the world. Sometimes there are five races in the world. Sometimes there are 11. Sometimes there are 20. Sometimes there's like 25. You know, it, the numbers vary. Of course, the point about the numbers varying is that it's all arbitrary, just kind of, just kind of made up. And so out of this kind of management of people, comes in the management of nature, out of the management of nature comes a further management of people. And you get these kind of horrifying situations where the politics is in some ways, I think, formed out of, and this is a kind of condition, a possibility for the whole of, of the colonial era. The politics are formed out of genocide. They're kind of responses to genocidal conquests. Uh, I guess most relevantly to uh, many of your listeners to in, 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 the, in North America as well, mm -hmm. uh, kind of obviously. Um, and so there's a, there are kind of what we call fire ecologies and emerges out of this as a question of tactics for managing nature and people who are considered part of nature inside colonial relationships. And so um, when you see this sort of extractivism, et cetera, coming out, when does, when does the actual idea that the environment itself stands in is symbolic for and is worth thinking about even in places where you're not from in terms of the colonial context. Yeah. Uh, and where does that get articulated? Maybe even aesthetically first, in your opinion, because I would even love to see so, when that's sort of, you know, even just baked into the propaganda, the landscape as well, you know? Yeah, totally. So, of course, the um, there are lots of different facets of this in different times. Probably the first one is when um, islands, uh, often islands in the Caribbean, are considered Edenic. That is literally like they are the Garden of Eden literally like they are um, yeah. places where, the, the, as if Adam and Eve could have been there. And suddenly the, the Garden of Eden is not in the Middle East, right? The Garden of Eden is suddenly um, somewhere in, in the Western Hemisphere. And this is a very kind of strange thing. And um, so there's, there's a kind of simultaneous affirmation 
of these places as Edens, as kind of perfect environments that need to be preserved in their kind of perfection and places that need to have um, extraction done in them. And so these are the kind of tensions. And I think this is the kind of tension, to be honest, that remains exactly to this day, right? And I would I would even go so far as to say that, you know, the two big pieces of, like, kind of eco-fascism that we've just seen, on the one hand, the Buffalo shooting, mm -hmm. the other hand, this decision by the Supreme Court about the EPA, I would say that it's perfectly plausible to see those two events as operating over this kind of this kind of schism in far right thinking. On the one hand, the protection of nature inside the nation. On the other hand, the exploitation of nature for the purposes of the nation. Right. So there's a kind of this tension that goes on to this to this day. So yeah, Edenic Islands. Later on, of course, you have this kind of almost horrifying turn in the late 19th century, in particular, um, towards the idea that um, nature beyond Europe is horribly pestilential, right? Mm -hmm. Full of mosquitoes, full of diseases, full of swamps and bogs and so on. And this is really a kind of a, a way of marking out a frustration with conquest, right? The conquest is going too slowly or that the, the, the empire is like too much falling mud. apart because too much goddamn there's too much mud. Yeah. And there's so many mud, so much mud. And importantly, also, there are lots of mosquitoes um, and there's lots of malaria and dengue fever and there's lots of you know, cholera and lots of just like all manner of like appalling things, which um, armies in particular really struggle with. Um, partially, it should be said, because they create the environment in which mosquitoes thrive. So one of the most kind of interesting parts of the book, I think, for, for my mind, is um, a, a description that comes from John O'Neill's uh, um, discussion of uh, what he calls mosquito empires. Um, and he says that the colonists produced these environments with this kind of molasses, slow dripping when they were producing sugarcane in the Caribbean. Have these kind of big open top things, which of course female mosquitoes love to drink, yeah, yeah. And, and it's male mosquitoes. They love to drink that. Um, the colonists, in order to entertain um, the, the colonizers, the, the kind of the more junior colonizers, bring um, monkeys of various sorts from Africa, they bring diseases with them. Um, they destroy all the tree cover in order to plant the, uh, the, the sugar cane. Um, they do all these kind of things. In, and they basically produce the perfect environment for mosquitoes so to, to thrive in, like a, a mosquito theme park, really. And so the, eventually the, the thing kind of falls apart under, under the, the weight of um, the horror of nature. So we move from the Edenic nature, the beautiful, the pristine, the pure, the, the, you know, mm -hmm. the wonderful, very rapidly, actually, um, over the course of the 19th century, towards nature as like horrifying, dreadful thing. And this is importantly also the time when Darwin and um, Darwinism becomes like a really important part of far right thinking. Not necessarily Darwinism in particular, but evolutionary thinking. The idea that nature is basically about struggle, it's basically about conflict. It is a zero sum game, and you are competing with everyone else in the world for like resources to have more children, basically. And this is when, of course, this gets parlayed into race science and, and then later on, I guess, into, into, into Nazism, right? So we're kind of, there's a kind of continuity of aesthetics of nature that produces uh, fascist uh, views of, of, of how nature should be organized, how she managed, and also importantly, as you were kind of hinting at, what it means for all of us and therefore what we should do about it and what it tells us to do people. So you're drawing this line, uh, and I think it's, you know, and it can quite easily, especially in North American context, take us through uh, Roosevelt, uh, Teddy, Roosevelt, Teddy, uh, and yeah. uh, John Muir and people from the conservation movement and the birth of national parks. Uh, and a kind of, you know, and I even think to give Roosevelt some credit, he didn't let, he didn't mind some mosquito nature either. But uh, in the book, you draw a line from uh, a different fellow named Madison Grant, who is a bit earlier, who's more in the stew of the mid 18th century that you're talking about. Sorry, the mid 19th century that you're talking about. Um, can can you uh, talk to us a bit about Madison Grant, his influence on what the movement looks like and how it gives it that maybe peculiar American flavor? So Madison Grant is um, totally part of the Teddy Roosevelt or Roosevelt Teddy story. Um, he's friends with him. He's like personal friends with him. Um, they're all part of an extremely elite fragment of New York society, uh, which believes very fervently in the masculine virtues of hunting uh, and the masculine virtues of dominating nature. That is broadly until Madison Grant decides that instead of preserving what they were doing before, preserving bits of nature, you know, deer and so on, in order to hunt them later, 
what they should do is they should preserve nature for its own sake, right? And that's the kind of the, the key shift that Madison Grant is, is, is um, involved in. But he's not just preserving any old nature and he's not preserving all of nature. So the formative experience we talk about in the book is when he's traveling around Europe, extremely wealthy man, sent off to Europe to study German and Latin and um, trigonometry or whatever you study. Um, and he goes off and he sees in these ancient houses, these old houses rather, elk or different kinds of antlered animals that have been hunted. And they have these enormous antlers. And he says, OK, well, what's happening here is that people have consistently tried to hunt the biggest antlers, right? The animal with the biggest antlers. And what that's meant is that that animal has consistently had fewer children than it would otherwise have. And therefore, what we have is a situation in which hunting is producing degeneracy. Mm. And degeneracy, mm. mm-hmm. big, vague concept, is completely fundamental to the rest of Madison Grant's thinking in every aspect of his thoughts. Um, he thinks about it in terms of race, of course. He thinks about it in terms of nature, of course. You know, he thinks about it in terms of politics, of course. He's not a Democrat, not in, even in the sense of you know, being a member of the Democrat Party. He's just not interested in democracy. He regards democracy as a, as a peculiar... Um, uh, thing that the American elite has to suffer. So um, Madison Grant is a very important figure, not only in the American context, but he's absolutely central to writing, for example, parts of the 1924 uh, racially exclusive um, immigration bill to the US, uh, but also really important for inspiring the Nazis. Um, Hitler describes his uh, book uh, as his Bible, and he also, importantly for our argument, supplies a whole bunch of arguments that really in some ways reveal the truth of the thing we're looking at. So in his later book, when he's much less popular, 1930 or thereabouts, popular obviously in Germany, not so popular at this point in, in America, um, because partially there's been a kind of shift in anthropology towards environmental anthropology and looking at people not just as kind of racially pure archetypes, but looking at them as products of their environment and culture and so on. So. He writes in, in his, his later book, Conquest of a Continent, about the reason why some nations are in tune with their environment. You know, the various nations around the world that he's uh, in favor of colonizing, for example, why those people are in, in tune with their environment. But people like Madison Grant, who locates his, you know, her, his kind of stock, so to speak, in England and, and Germany, why they are not in England and Germany or indeed in the Nordic winter, uh, hinterlands, um, which have um, given his race the hardy character that he believes they have. So why is he not there? And instead in like a really massive mansion in like Long Island. So he's got to explain that, right? So he'd be like, well, the reason is because white people and white people alone, or sorry, not white people, Nordics, because he divides white people up. Nordics have and have alone an aptitude for conquest. Mm which means that they I've heard deserve <laughs> their conquests. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it, it's if you're in a particular place, um, that's good. But if we, and we alone are somewhere else, that's also good. So we have the right to the whole world. But what does this tell you? It tells you he's an opportunist, basically. It tells you he's, he's willing to essentially justify anything, right? And I think that is really at the core of what I think is important to think about when we think about fascism. I said earlier, the fascism is a politics of, of, of the nation and the nation has two parts, nature and a set of like social relationships, business opportunities and so on, um, capital as part of the nation. But also what this means is that the nation, if you're going to affirm the nation, then because it's such a grab bag of stuff, you can just pick whatever it is you want to affirm at any given time and you can just run with that. You can say, OK, well, today we need to strategically for our political aims, we need to affirm this. Okay, so that's good today. And tomorrow, we need to affirm something else. So that's good then. And so we can just pick and choose anything. And this is why I think fascism seems like, on the one hand, the most like principled political movement, right? The most kind of like um, overawed by its own ideals, and at the same time, the most deeply and profoundly opportunistic and just like uh, concerned with winning at all costs. And I think this is the kind of the tension that we can see. In, in the contemporary far right, as well as in Madison, Madison Grant. But he's absolutely, yeah, you're right. He's, he's a pivotal figure. Uh, understanding him is really important for the American context. Yeah, and it was, it was interesting to read about, you know, a towering figure who I did not honestly know, know much about. Um, you know, speaking of sort of fascism proper, uh, which we are getting right. into now, we're getting into that time. 
Um, I also yeah. was, you know, interested in in the book. You talk about kind of Italians embracing a bit of their kind of countryside mentality, uh, which is not necessarily in in in, uh, in their fascism, you know, in this sort of way, yeah. which is different than the kind of civic kind of post Roman fascism. That's different than what the mm -hmm. aesthetic is naturally. And also runs to a bit if you think that anyone anywhere would have the techno future kind of uh, take on fascism and not the traditional mm. we love the trees take on fascism would be Italy with this sort of more rich intellectual uh, fascistic for its own sake, maybe take on it all. Uh, although yeah. you put it into a colonial context, which does make it interesting, but but. Uh, we often sort of leave Italy out of the conversation. We talk about fascism, yes, even though it's yes, perfectly absolutely. a perfectly good example of it. Yeah, frankly, you know, <laughs> it's 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 the best example. Yeah, yeah. Um, not that I think Italian fascism was good. Don't, don't no, 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 no. But it's no, the good uh, stuff. It's the good stuff. Though. It, yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah. <laughs> let's um yeah. So the so how do Italian fascists relate to nature? Well, let's start with the Nazis instead. Right. So how do the Nazis relate to nature? Right. They think. They have two parts. They think nature, nature is the nation, and therefore nature has to be protected. But also they think the nature has to be put to work for the nation. And therefore, we're going to just like destroy these forests in order to fund the war machine. So there's kind of the contradictory part. Italian fascism has no such contradiction, right? It is just much more straightforwardly, aggressively modernist. Um, the purpose of nature is to be subjected by the fascist in the creation of the new man, the new person. Uh, well, the, not the new person, just the new man, actually, who can kind of tower a, a, a top yeah. nature and who can kind of suppress it. The kind of weird thing in the book, uh, we talk about when there was this big campaign of public works to dredge these swamps that are outside Rome, they were like, okay, well, what can we do to make the connection between what we really believe in and this kind of boring project of like dredging these swamps? Well, they name all the little camps they set up in order for the, the workers to stay in while they're doing this dredging work, they name them after the battles of the First World War. They're like, this is, you know, I don't know any of the names of battles, but like, this is this, this battle, this is this battle, this is this battle. What we were doing in the First World War, the brutal mechanized warfare, we now have to do against nature. Nature is the real, mm. the real enemy here. And so Italian fascism is like, in some ways simpler, um, more straightforward, more aggressively modernistic, as you were saying. Obviously, the legacy of the futurist is in there somewhere. Yeah, it is. Um, Whereas yeah, the, the German fascism case is much more, much more kind of complex and and tries to have its its um well not its cake and eat it too, but tries to have its uh, its black forest and destroy it too or something. I don't know exactly how I'd phrase that, but like there's a kind of a there's a kind of contradiction there inside Nazism, obviously, but uh, the Italian fascism displaces somewhere else. Yeah, and again, it almost isn't. A, it, it is almost just starting with the kind of different appreciation of nature means they kind of have to pretend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In a way, the Italians just don't have to pretend. Speaking of pretending, yeah. I think an interesting tension that takes us more into the modern era would be the kind of, you know, whether it's Nixon and the EPA coming up in the yeah. early 70s, at the same time as denial is being seeded in through the conservative movement through in America, folks like the Koch brothers, et cetera, you know. But like what what is happening there and how does that lead to what I think is probably the modern tension, which is between people who want to go full bore denial and then full bore, which seems to, which seems like it would be to our naive minds hard to do at the same time as pursuing eco-fascism uh, in, in a messaging yeah. way, but you have something to say about that for sure. So, uh, yeah. So I think, I think, I think we'd be absolutely right to say that there were, there was a contradiction here <laughs> because I think that fascism is a contradictory political, uh, yeah, kind of um, product. Basically, people and myself included have been a bit too pedantic. I think when we said this is ecofascism, this is this is ecofascism, this is right because we want to draw our lines around our concepts. You want to say, okay, we can keep this concept relatively clear and and, and well defined, but fascism is opportunistic. Right, it's going to have lots of different parts. It's going to affirm lots of different things at different times. It's going to be brutal all the time. I think it's going to be um, operated different scales and so on. And so when we're talking about this concept, we're really talking about a thing that is itself contradictory, and therefore we should expect it to have, as you're kind of you know intimating, we should expect it to have it on the one hand bits of nature protection involved with it, bits of like affirmation of like the national capitalism involved with it. We should expect to have different parts all over the place. 
Um, as to how the how we shift from a kind of a, I would say almost hegemonic view of environmentalism in the seventies as the universal uh, thing that everyone can agree on. Right? You know, Nixon, of course, brings in lots of environmental protections, but he has support from from Democrats to do so. Um, and Nixon is obviously not a left winger. Um, is there really the kind of fulcrum around which um, the way we get from one to the other is that we have to shift through a collection of really particular struggles, I think. In the US context, the really key one, I think, is Warren County, right? Mm -hmm. Warren County is, is a struggle that people are probably quite aware of. Um, basically, there was some toxic waste that was going to be dumped uh, in a predominantly African-American community, um, as it had been for like hundreds of years by that point. I mean, like, you know, the dumping of toxic waste, the environmental damage of that, of that form is uh, very, very racialized, particularly in America. Um, and they, they, there was a campaign to prevent this from happening. Um, but the campaign wasn't simply that they would move the toxic waste elsewhere, but that it would actually be adequately treated and cleaned so that no one would suffer from this. And so there was a tension before between, on the one hand, sustainability, and on the other hand, justice. And what this manages to do is manage to put them together. In fact, justice is the essence of sustainability. They are the same thing. And once we have this idea that environmentalism and social justice go together, as I think they, they ought to, once you have that idea, then it becomes a really toxic thing for the, or a really kind of horrible thing uh, for the right to engage with, right? Because it looks too much like amelioration. It looks too much like leftism, communism, even in the 1970s and 80s. And so there's a kind of shift away. The other thing that really matters is that it shifts in scale from mm -hmm. being things that more or less everyone can agree on, at least in principle, which is that you know, factories should not dump loads of like just toxic sludge in rivers and people drink from that river like that shouldn't happen that's pretty easy for everyone to agree on however what becomes really difficult to agree on is that fossil fuels in general that is essentially capitalism in general because capitalism on a global scale relies on fossil fuels and probably couldn't get by without them at least you know not until there's something very different in place once capitalism in general is threatened by environmentalism then the right simply has to get behind capitalism, right? And suppress environmentalism. So this is not, this is not real, it's not, not happening. And so it's the, really the shift to the global scale or the shift to the scale of the, the whole of the nation or the shift to the scale of the whole of the economy rather than just like bad practices in the economy that means that we get this kind of growth of denialism. Um, it also happens that there are lots of organizations um, from the Cold War, anti-communist organizations from the Cold War who, are, who once the Cold War are over, basically have loads of cash, loads of quite like far right ideas, and kind of not a lot to do. And the environmental movement is like right there. So just like fight that. And that gives you an impetus to carry on fundraising to carry on, you know, kind of um, imagining this kind of red terror, even though the Soviet Union has, has fallen apart and it's gone. So yeah, it's, it's they're really, I guess, like particular aspects of the history, but there's this much more fundamental thing, which is the shift towards environmentalism as a global problem, or a problem for the whole capital, rather than like a problem of that river, that tree, this forest, and so on. Yeah, and I will say from an electoral standpoint, you see uh, a lot of people winning referendums and other uh, democratic you know, uh, elections, coalitions forming together when it is about pollution specifically and yep. not climate change, because this is extremely broadly appealing to people for a variety <laughs> of reasons, some of which yes. are even human. Uh, <laughs> but leaving the human and back to the politics, I think one of the big points you make and made to us last time and has been with me is the falseness of the promise uh, of the right wing when it comes to delivering on Absolutely. environmentalism, which does require some kind of a break with our means of production, maybe even modes of production. Who can say? Uh, but uh, but. Well, what's going to happen? I mean, right now you have, say, a generally squishy center left to left environmental movement um, that has held their noses and voted for folks like Macron and Schultz and Biden. Yeah. Um, maybe even someday Keir Starmer in the UK. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. No, <laughs> no <laughs> one's going to vote against that. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but it, it, but they're not planning on delivering to them, and that's why they're going to lose them to the right, seemingly. So what is the magic sauce that's going to make the right not have to deliver on that? What are they, what do you see them baking into the cake that is kind of the magic, you know, escape hatch that keeps people in the lobster trap once they crawl in? 
in the lobster shop of the right or in the lobster yeah, shop of the Yeah, of, of the fact of like, we are your ecological friends, you know, like oh, we care yeah. about what you care about. It's like, well, do you? Like, mm. you know, it's going to be hard to maintain that forever. I think, I think the thing is that it really depends on country by country. So the UK, very shielded from climate change, um, by the standards of almost every other country. It's the least vulnerable country, I think. Maybe France is a bit less vulnerable. One of the least vulnerable countries. Our weather is terrible. Well, it's been really nice, I have to say, for the last few months. So I, I want to just shout out the UK's weather. Not often it gets a shout out. So, you know, it's been really good. Um, the UK doesn't have extreme weather events, has heat waves occasionally, doesn't have, you know, monsoons. It doesn't have, you know, uh, hurricanes. Um, it doesn't have earthquakes. It doesn't have any of these kind of big things. It's quite like a mild climate here. Um, and so I think it's the appearance of extreme weather events and their increasing rapidity in obviously the US South and obviously in, in California and you know, the, the wildfires and so on. Those make it much, much, much more obvious what the stakes of climate change are. And so I think in those places, it's going to take some real effort around things like cultural issues and so on for the right to keep people voting for them. But in the UK, if climate change doesn't like immediately make anything set on fire here, or doesn't you know, destroy parts of the UK, flooding is the other thing that might happen in the UK, it's quite, quite dangerous, then I think they, that, that can be pushed back quite a lot. Um, and so really what it is, it's a question of securitization and displacement. Like how well can the right-wing government displace the problems, um, both in terms of blame or in terms of like their material effects, or how well can they securitize them? That means they turn them into problems of um, security of the military, of the border police, of, the, of policing and so on, and therefore generate support for their own projects, which are often of securitization. As, product, as problems get worse, they just say, okay, well, this requires more and more funding. This requires more and more military, more police and so on. And we will do exactly that stuff. So I think in terms of adaptation to climate change, they're unlikely to be able to do anything really substantive. In terms of the, um, sorry, in terms of mitigation of climate change, they're unlikely to do anything substantial. In terms of adaptation to climate change, they're going to increasingly steer towards securitization, towards like the, the most brutal responses to climate change. And lots of those mean playing up talking points that are already existing, right? Quite likely, there will be lots of migration from Central America into the US because of climate change, right? That area around the tropics is going to be basically unlivable pretty soon. That means lots more migration, probably. It's not certain, but probably. That will play into the American rights, you know, scaremongering about migrant caravans. Right? It's just it's as simple as that. So I think, yeah, uh, the really key thing to watch is the way in which adaptation takes over from mitigation in the talking about climate change. The, the move will be, it's happening, it's here. We can't do anything about it now. We've just got to like hunker down and, and you know, uh, securitize what we have. That's going to be the move, I think. And I guess just over the fence on, you know, not the border, but just over the argument, <laughs> just over the argument fence uh, onto the corporate side of things. I wonder yep. if, um, will the argument continue to be that c people are consuming things wrong and that's why we have, you know, uh, problems with, you know, some of the, whether it be pollution, plastic, uh, fossil fuel, this kind of, like the same way that littering became and recycling became something that consumers were supposed to do rather than companies. Will that be the same? Will that be even part of the security apparatus kind of policing, the, policing people not doing the cleanup efforts? I think that most of this will take the form of um, a very intricate kind of security apparatus um, or kind of surveillance apparatus rather. I think security is probably a bit of an inaccurate term. Um, Exactly how that would play out, I don't really want to again, give anyone any, any ideas, uh, but I can very much imagine that um, purchases, for example, people will be given uh, allowances for certain kinds of, you know, kind of um, purchases they can make, um, but there'll be, of course, ways of buying more. So it'll turn into something very similar to um, what the Catholic Church did in the uh, 1400s, um, when they kind of sold indulgences, right? You can, you know, kind of sell, you can everyone you, you go to the priest and, and, the, and you, you confess your sins to the priest and that's okay but like there are other people but you've got, you've got the mortal sins but you pay us like 20 quid you know then you can like have your mortal sins exonerated and i think we'll essentially get into a similar kind of 
of system like that where there will be uh yeah essentially get outs for people to to act as they were before but moral hierarchies and a lot of uh green technologies will come with a with a sense of moral superiority um that might on the international stage turn into uh kind of pawns in a game of international competition right so america let's say it has like very high tesla cars uptakes right forget for the moment hopefully please that tesla relies on like a destruction of uh, oh incredibly you know, unenvironmental yeah yeah a whole litany really, of things that we don't even yeah. need to get into yeah just yeah, like yeah. But, but just like just forget about that because you know the main problem is of course the the, the carbon dioxide in this there's slum somewhat less of that right in in, in the sky so and, and let's say that the that, that chinese consumers stick with you know kind of um petrol guzzling um cars right so you can imagine a situation in which the um being environmentally friendly becomes a kind of a consumer choice but also a consumer choice that is indexed to uh the the value of the product right so you can imagine mm -hmm. a situation in which like the luxury car is co2 friendly rather than the other one right uh, which is you know, kind of still um regarded as polluting and therefore it becomes a matter of class but also it becomes a matter of kind of geopolitical blame shifting you know mm -hmm. the problem is not america the problem is china the problem is you know, india where they have lots of cars as well the problem is you know indonesia like you know whoever you want to pick really. like whoever is useful for you to pick at that exact moment that is whose fault it is and it's definitely not yours you have a you know, the kind of uh, the green tick of um approval or something right so yeah i think that this politics is is, is a total dead end obviously uh in terms of the real thing that matters which is the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and also the environmental destruction of uh, you know, production in general, but also, yeah, I think I think um, it will have to be quite like, force, forcefully resisted because it will be useful to a lot of people. Yeah, no, I, it wasn't even until we had this conversation just now that I had the image in my mind of uh, the U.S. actually invading a country militarily because it's built too many coal plants or something. Yeah. You know, this while at the same possible. time unleashing so much jet fuel yeah. that it like yeah. you know eclipses the, the you know the amount that the people in whatever small country that doesn't have a lot going on <laughs> to yeah. begin with, like, you know, just, I, I never thought about that, but the kind of eco justification for invasion is maybe not far off. It's not if... far off. No. Absolutely not. Yeah. I, and what is the U S military? The fifth something, no, the, 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 is it the largest single polluter in the world? Something I, it's, it's up there in the top. Top to you. It both uh, is and also has one of the kind of um, best PR kind of green machines oh, about really? things right. that it does because yeah yeah it's, you know uh, especially when I was in the government during during Obama administration the kind of green jets and this and that and the you know green the military jets. it's this is a security thing we care about we care about the climate because it's a security thing kind of putting forth yep. that the military was this very hard nosed practical thing that when push comes to shove they do see the security. Uh, scares in in a world affected by climate change, and so Absolutely. they are unlike the big companies. But at the same time, as you know, it's a big circular argument that involves these same companies to yes. begin with. Yeah. Oh no, we've caused this problem. We must we must stick around. Indeed, increase. We're doing what we were doing before in order to, to solve the problem. Yes, it's a, yeah. a typical trick. What are the green jets? That's crazy. I've never heard it was, of it. Uh, it was, um, oh, is it biofuel? Biofuel, biofuel the, jets yeah. for um, ah. the something Hornets, I think. So. It was, I forget exactly right. what the name of the jet right. was, but it was, you know, fairly serious combat ready jets that could fly on biodiesel. Not everyone was totally convinced, but they were going ahead with the prototypes. Can biofuels melt steel beams or is that just jet fuel? <laughs> that is a question we'll have to ask the committee program scientists. We don't often get them on the show, but we would not want to commit that to YouTube without checking it first because yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, you don't know with steel it's, it's, beams ends. It ends in tears. And where we want folks to end up is purchasing the rise of eco-fascism. Uh, Sam Moore, thank you so much for coming on. And where, where, did, where is your preferred place that people buy the book from? Just so, give it a quick plug exactly the best way. Just get a just go to an independent bookstore. Like there are, they, this distribution has been pretty wide. Um, you can go to any of them in the US, any of them in the UK. There was one in Cornwall, which I don't know. You know the geography of the UK. Cornwall it's is very nowhere. hard to get to Cornwall. Yeah, it's like it's like absolutely nowhere. Yeah, um, it's all of like six hours drive away from me. Which I mean, that's a long way in the UK. I know it's not a long way in the US. In Texas, it's we call that halfway between El Paso. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so the, it's a it's a long way, and they had uh, a collection of books, and they sold out on the first day. So. 
I'm very happy about that. But if like, they don't have it, just ask them. They'll order it. It'll take a couple of days. It, it's yeah. not a big deal. Yeah. It's an excuse to walk in there. I think people worry, oh, they won't have it. It's like, then you just ask them and then you have a conversation yeah. and it's fine. Yeah, do so. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I'm glad we could do this for the end of the season and we'll have you back on soon and we'll talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. The goal was the Bastille thick walled fortress where political prisoners were kept, guarded by a military garrison. The armed people of Paris converged on this symbol of royal authority. The brief siege ended when a gate was opened mysteriously from inside, giving the crowd access. Within minutes of surrendering his garrison, the warden was hacked to pieces, his head borne off on a pike by a crowd angered by its losses, a hundred killed in the battle. But when it was over, only seven prisoners were found in the Bastille. More important, one of Europe's most impregnable fortresses, symbol of the old order, had been stormed and taken by a mob. It was dismantled by the people of Paris. Hi, and welcome back to the committee program. I am your host, Arun Chaudhary, and this is our Bastille Day Spectacular. In fact, the third annual Bastille Day Spectacular. And in this segment, we're actually going to get into it in a real way around what Bastille Day means, because we are talking with French historian Mathilde Lorera, uh, who specializes actually in the French Revolution. Thank you so much for being here and for speaking with us. And thank you for your invitation. Look, of all the places that I've worked in Europe, in France, politicians are the most likely to invoke the past, even when addressing present issues, and this includes the revolution. Can you tell us a bit about the space the revolution still captures in the French political mind, not the cultural one, the living history of it as used in politics? Oui, alors effectivement, le, les, les politiciens, les journalistes, enfin tous ceux qui interviennent dans la vie politique, ont une espèce de passion pour la citation révolutionnaire. Euh, la Révolution française, et pas seulement hein, cette année, c'est de la Commune dont on a beaucoup parlé. Alors ça, ça s'explique euh, évidemment, ben, vous l'avez dit, de toute façon, quand euh, les politiciens parlent de la Révolution française, c'est pas pour faire un débat de scientifique. Hein. Déjà que de toute façon, en général, ils connaissent pas grand-chose à la Révolution française, donc euh, ce qu'ils en disent est souvent tout à fait caricatural. Donc l'enjeu est pas de comprendre la Révolution française, l'enjeu pour eux est de dire des choses du présent. Et en fait, ça s'explique parce que, euh, les, les, les conflits qui se sont joués au moment de la Révolution française, hein, finalement, euh, opposent des forces politiques qui sont toujours en conflit de nos jours, avec... Euh Bon, les contre-révolutionnaires ont été largement écartés, donc la question ne se pose plus vraiment. Euh, mais sinon, entre les libéraux euh, et les démocrates sociaux, les républicains démocrates sociaux, qui est un combat de la Révolution française, hein, d'une certaine façon c'est l'opposition entre, euh, ben, entre les, les fameux Girondins et les Montagnards, hein, et ben ça se rejoue actuellement. Donc euh, invoquer tel ou tel personnage de la Révolution française hein, permet de rejouer le combat. Je vous donne un exemple. Robespierre, Robespierre qui va être en permanence cité par par la gauche, ce qu'on appelle en France la gauche de la gauche, donc le, 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 maintenant la gauche du PS, parce qu'on considère que le PS est sorti de la gauche, de, de cette gauche-là, Robespierre est évoqué. Alors qu'à l'inverse, dans tout le camp libéral, Robespierre c'est le bourreau, le psychopathe sanguinaire, absolument insupportable, on ne pense qu'à la guillotine, etc. Ce qui se joue là, en fait, ce n'est pas la question de savoir quel est le rôle réel de Robespierre dans la Révolution française, mais de savoir si l'égalité doit l'emporter sur la liberté, ou l'inverse, doit ça, ça permet de s'engueuler se, de, de sur les questions de importance de la politique sociale euh, au regard euh, d'autres de, de, politiques. Donc c'est des enjeux du présent. Et, et s'agissant de, de la prise de la Bastille, on, on voit aussi euh, en ce moment le gros débat et de savoir si notre 14 juillet célèbre la fête de la Fédération ou la prise de la Bastille. Et évidemment, le camp libéral et le camp au pouvoir actuellement dit que le 14 juillet, c'est la fête de la Fédération. Pourquoi Parce que comment assumer le fait que notre fête nationale soit la célébration, en fait, d'une journée émeutière, révolutionnaire Ce alors que, en ce moment et depuis quelques années, le pouvoir est face à des formes insurrectionnelles dans la rue. Donc, comme, comme la, la fête nationale repose pour partie sur la célébration d'un jour où le peuple s'est 
est saisi euh, de la violence, eh bien, il y a une volonté de dire que euh, non, non, la pri le, le 14 juillet, c'est pas la prise de la Bastille, c'est la fête consensuelle de la Fédération. Et à l'inverse, toute la gauche dit mais non, pas du tout, c'est la fête de la, c'est la prise de la Bastille, euh, etc., etc. Alors que c'est les deux en fait, c'est les deux et c'est pour ça que l'historien, euh, ben bah, voilà, moi je peux pas dire d'un côté euh, c'est la fête de la fédération parce que ce n'est pas que ça, c'est la prise de la Bastille parce que c'est pas que ça, parce que historiquement c'est les deux. Mais le débat actuel n'est évidemment pas une question sur pourquoi ce choix de la date du 14 juillet, mais quelle reconnaissance politiquement peut-on avoir d'une violence qui est une violence populaire En d'autres termes, le, le peuple peut-il euh, se saisir d'une violence politique légitime Et c'est ça l'enjeu. Donc l'enjeu, il est au présent, il n'est pas au passé. Ok, so if I try to sum it up, uh, basically talking about revolution helps to talk about today because actually politicians in France are barely Um, aware of the complexity of the historian issue, of the expertise issue of revolution. That being said, some examples, the figure of Robespierre, which is a famous revolutionary uh, yeah. leader, is uh, systematically um, uh, quoted by the left of the left, the radical left, as an example. And at the same time, on the right hand side of the test, of the political test, he is um, um, a Yeah, he's a, the a cutthroat man, uh, the guy who used the, gui the guillotine. Um, so what is at stake with that character is not if or if not Robespierre is a good man, but if liberty, freedom is more important than equality. Um, because we have in our national devise, uh, liberté, égalité, fraternité, And they are all the same on the same level on the head of the city halls. But actually, there is a stake political issues of how we prioritize liberty regarding equality. That is the first example. Second example, the question of Bastille Day. Bastille Day, which is in English Bastille Day, but in French, 14th of July. Actually, uh, there is debate in France about what is celebrated on 14th of July. Is it the take The fact that some people in 1789 took the Bastille and um, as during a riot, which was the first uh, oui. spark of the revolution, or is it the event that happened one year later in 1790, which gathered all the tiers d'état? Um, I don't know how you say that. Well, all the La people nation. in a very uh, yeah, all the yeah, all the nation in a gathering of representatives of all the departments of France in Paris and named the uh, Fed, uh, yeah, Federation Party, let's say. And uh, actually, what is interesting is that our National Day is celebrating both of the events, but there is a political debate of which one is the most important to, um, to push because the right which is in power today cannot Um, be consistent in celebrating the uh, 14th of July while it's a riot day, while there are so many riots at the moment, it would be a way to legitimate uh, popular riots and popular violence. And this is absolutely impossible for the control freak power of Emmanuel Macron. Okay. So uh, that's why they are trying to pretend that it's only La Fête de la Fédération while well, actually it's both, and in the popular imaginary and in the international in imaginary, it's Bastille Day. And do you think that this sort of... Um, the ease with which people do use the kind of nostalgia and rhetoric uh, of the revolution um, has an impact on sort of street level politics in France? Do you see people going to, you know, reaching for those tactics because uh, people use this kind of rhetoric more easily? Je suis pas complètement sûr d'avoir tout compris. C'est comment le, le peuple utilise. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Can you repeat, Aaron? Because, because uh, neither uh, Martin nor I yeah, yeah, yeah. understood uh, the question properly. Yeah, yeah. Because politicians are using, um, you know, or, or because the at least some folks uh, are using the kind of rhetoric of the of the of revolutionary tactics, do does that sort of does it 
become easier for the public to sort of uh, justify using those as opposed to maybe other European countries. Do you understand okay. what I mean? Donc, la question, Mathilde, c'est est-ce que, euh, selon vous, euh, c'est parce qu'il y a des politiciens qui utilisent la rhétorique révolutionnaire Are you talking about the left or the right? When or you like the yellow vest or, you know, rhetoric. famously in France, demonstrations sort of happen a little faster and maybe even the police get involved ah, a little faster. C'est bon. Je, enfin, je, je vois ce, le, le truc. Euh, alors, <rire> la poule et l'œuf. Euh, bon, d'abord, ce qu'il faut voir, c'est que le retour de la citation à la Révolution française dans euh, les mouvements sociaux contemporains, euh, qui est très net lors du mouvement des Gilets jaunes, les Gilets jaunes ont abond abondamment cité la Révolution française. Hein. Il y a eu énormément euh, de graffiti en citation à la Révolution française. Euh, il y a des Gilets jaunes qui, en plus du Gilet jaune, ont mis un bonnet phrygien, qui est donc euh, le bonnet que portaient les révolutionnaires et notamment les sans-culottes. Il y a eu des guillotines, évidemment de carton, hein, qui ont été euh, euh, construites sur des ronds-points. Donc la Révolution française a été abondamment citée par les Gilets jaunes, euh, mais c'était finalement une grande nouveauté. Dans les mouvements sociaux précédents, euh, la Révolution française n'était pratiquement jamais citée, euh, ce qui peut s'expliquer parce que pour la gauche la plus radicale, la Révolution française est considérée, c'est une vulgate un peu marxiste, mais, euh, mais ça peut, enfin, disons qu'on peut le discuter euh, euh, scientifiquement, euh, la Révolution française était considérée comme une révolution bourgeoise. Donc ce n'était pas une bonne révolution à, à, à évoquer. Donc on évoquait plus souvent la Commune de Paris, ou on évoquait parfois 68, ou on évoquait des révolutions du XXe siècle, euh, qu'elle soit castriste, maoïste, enfin voilà. Donc euh, la Révolution française, pendant très longtemps, n'a pas du tout été citée dans les mouvements sociaux. Il faut remonter au Front populaire hein, pour qu'elle euh, ait été citée. Et là, la nouveauté avec les Gilets jaunes, c'est qu'elle était citée. Ça s'explique parce que la Révolution française est la révolution la plus connue des classes populaires, parce qu'elle est enseignée à l'école, ce qui n'est pas toujours le cas des autres, qui est d'ailleurs de moins en moins le cas des autres, et parce que c'est un élément de la culture populaire, avec des films, avec des comédies musicales, donc c'est quelque chose qui imprègne les imaginaires. Quand euh, les, les Gilets jaunes citent euh, dans leur mouvement, euh, par, que ce soit par graffiti, que ce soit par utilisation des symboles de la Révolution, hein, il n'est pas question pour eux de refaire la Révolution ou quoi que ce soit, euh, c'est une façon de dire... Euh, ça, ça reprend ce que je disais tout à l'heure, c'est une façon de dire nous « avons, nous avons la souveraineté du peuple et donc nous avons la possibilité d'utiliser de façon légitime la violence politique ». Parce que la révolution, ce qu'elle a posé, c'est finalement refuser le monopole de la violence légitime par l'État et poser la possibilité euh, que le peuple euh, puisse se saisir de la violence légitime. Ce qui a joué, ce n'est pas que les politiques parlent de la Révolution française. Ce qui a joué aussi, c'est que Macron, lui, a réactivé une mémoire monarchiste. Et en fait, euh, Macron, en réinvestissant Versailles, auquel, dans lequel il est allé beaucoup plus que tous les autres présidents, en disant dans des interviews que il manquait un roi à la France, que la France ne s'était pas remise d'avoir tué le roi, et, et, et donc l'impression d'un pouvoir qui n'est plus présidentiel, mais d'un pouvoir qui devient monarchiste, et eh bien a suscité en réaction dans le mouvement social des Gilets jaunes, et eh bien la réactivation en face de la révolution qui justement a mis fin euh, à, à ce pouvoir monarchiste. Donc c'est plus l'utilisation le, 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 monarchiste et la pratique de facto, monarchiste n'est pas forcément le, le bon terme, mais au moins dans le sens étymologique, donc pouvoir d'un seul euh, de Macron, qui a poussé euh, le mouvement social à activer en face euh, le passé révolutionnaire. Ok, it's, it's gold. Uh, ready. So, um, basically, uh, the fact to talk about revolution is very clear in the recent years with the Yellow Vest movement, uh, which has talked and quoted and made graffitis and images of the revolution as uh, symbols of their own, with the revolutionary hat of the revolutioners, with cool, the yeah. guillotine in, uh, in carton box. And this is very new, because actually, Um, until then, in social movements in France, the French Revolution is uh, uh, 
uh, rarely quoted as a reference because for the radical left, it's considered as a bourgeois revolution. And for that reason, when we tr pretend to make the revolution in France, we talk more about M May 68 or Castrist revolutions mm. or Maoist revolutions. And um, to have some quotations of the French Revolution in the past, we have to go back to the 1930s with the Popular Front. Um, why the Yellow Vest movement has been so uh, re um, eager to talk about the French Revolution, a few elements. First, it's, it's the most well-known revolution in France because we have, more, we have five republics, but we have several revolutions too. And um, the French Revolution is the only one which is um, in the education program of each and every one since uh, the young age. The second element is that there is a popular culture imaginary of the French Revolution with movies, with musicals, with songs. For these reasons, when um, it was easy for Yellow Vest to appropriate themselves the French Revolution message. But also, it was to show the legitimacy of their fight, of their uh, struggle, uh, because uh, actually it's about the legitimacy of violence and the French Revolution in the moment where uh, the people of France refused the monopoly of violence, legitimate violence to the only state, but retook it. And last, what played also is not because some people on the left talk about the revolution, it's because some people at the power behave like kings. And Macron has very intensely reactivated the memory of the king and the monarchy because he has been a lot to Versailles. He is in the First Republic, the president who has been so uh, often, the most uh, frequently to Versailles, which is the palace of um, King, uh, King Sun, Sun King. Sun King. Yeah, yeah, Here yeah. We are. Uh, he has pretended that a king was missing for French people who had not um, made the courtesies of the death of the king. And all these elements make that Emmanuel Macron behave on some parts as king. And for that reason, the Yellow Vest behave as a, peop a revolutionary people. Is this deliberate on Macron's part? Do you think is there some, is there some base he's trying to appeal with this quasi-monarchical uh, stance? Is it voluntary of Macron to comport like a king? Euh, ou est-ce que c'est euh, il le fait euh, c'est pas vraiment sa faute est-ce que est-ce qu'il y a une stratégie chez Macron et est-ce qu'il y a une volonté d'apparaître comme euh, j'aurais tendance à dire un président que j'aurais tendance à dire que c'est tellement euh, répétitif euh, euh... Enfin, je veux dire, il est quand même euh, suffisamment euh, au courant euh, de l'histoire euh, de, de, de... De, de, des risques d'une telle instrumentalisation d'un passé euh, pour que ce soit volontaire, hein. euh, ça n'en reste pas moins complètement surprenant. Euh, c'est vrai que c'est là, moi j'avoue que j'étais j'ai été assez désarçonné, euh, des, désarçonné. La fameuse interview, euh, je crois que c'est à Lops où il dit que voilà, la France ne s'est jamais remis d'avoir perdu un roi et enfin c'était complètement hallucinant, les, les, les bras les bras m'ont tombé donc. Euh, oui, c'est volontaire. Quelle stratégie Je suis incapable de le comprendre parce que ça, ça ne peut créer que des effets pervers. Et est-ce que vous voulez parler de son surnom de Jupiter, Mathilde Oui, mais je... Est-ce que ça a un lien avec ça bah Là, est, on est plus dans la personnalisation du pouvoir, d'une certaine façon. C'est-à-dire que, de toute façon, la Ve République est une, est une république euh, présidentielle et qui s'est renforcée. Donc, on est dans la personnalisation du pouvoir et, et lui... Euh, l'a fait euh, plus encore. Il n'était pas obligé de réactiver la mémoire monarchiste. Hein. Il, pouvait, euh, il pouvait finalement euh, rester dans, dans sa personnalisation, pipolisation, euh, sans être obligé euh, de, de, de réactiver cette mémoire monarchiste. Après, cette mémoire monarchiste a été réactivée contre lui aussi, avec euh, tous les gens qui ont comparé euh, Bernadette Macron à Marie-Antoinette et, euh, et les caricaturistes qui... Euh, qui ont mis sa tête sur la tête de Louis XVI enfin, en faisant des, des photoshops. Cela dit, c'était le cas des autres. Hein. Ça, c'est le propre de la, la cinquième et de tradition monarchique dans sa constitution. Donc, euh, c'est donc normal. Mais lui, il l'a fait encore plus que d'autres. So, uh, Mathilde said that um, Macron does do that so explicitly and so frequently that it's hard to imagine that it's not a conscious behavior of him, of his. Uh, and also because uh, Macron is not uh, an uh, undercultured uh, person, he is pretty aware of history of France, and he is aware of the risk of such an instrumentalization 
of the past. And at the same time, it's quite uh, hard to understand um, why he does that, because there are so uh, many negative elements when you pretend to be a king yeah, facing agree. revolutionary um, people. So it's hard to understand. But it's also contributing to, I mean, it's also because the Fifth Republic, which we are uh, in right now, is a very um, personalized power a way of uh, leading the country. And uh, so it's kind of consubstantial with uh, the, the regime itself. And then uh, I know we have limited time, but my last question is also kind of a big one, which is um, in her book, The Abolition of Political Parties, uh, Simone Well suggests that the French Revolution marks a turning point of politics becoming professional and that once this happens, something is lost in order to sort of, you know, for a party to exist, collect dues, this kind of thing. It's something that I think about in relationship to the Democratic Party in the USA a lot you know, political parties as sort of businesses. Um, do you similarly see there being a sort of binary point that is the French Revolution in, in which the professionalization uh, of politics really accelerates? Alors, autant, uh, je trouve que les... les, les... Oui, oui, non, ça, j'ai compris. Euh, autant les, les critiques que Simone Veil euh, fait, euh, fait, dans, fait dans ses notes euh, sur la suppression des partis, en, en, dans les années, euh, on est dans les années 20, hein, euh, sont, sont partis euh, largement justifiés, autant euh, son analyse euh, de l'origine et, et du rôle matriciel de la Révolution française euh, dedans, moi je ne suis pas d'accord. Il n'y a pas du tout de, de professionnalisation euh, de, de la vie politique euh, sous la Révolution française, il n'y a pas de parti sous la Révolution française. Euh, il y a des clubs qui sont des espaces de discussion, qui sont des espaces de diffusion des idées, euh, qu'il y ait à la, à, dans les différentes assemblées des moments où euh, des groupes se forment. Euh, voilà, on a pu parler euh, des, euh, des Girondins, des Montagnards, hein, mais ce ne sont absolument pas des partis, ni au sens moderne, ni au sens même que prendront les partis dans l'espace anglo-saxon, que ce soit en Angleterre ou aux États-Unis. La France est très en retard par rapport au monde anglo-saxon dans la naissance des partis politiques parce que justement elle ne veut pas des partis politiques par peur des corps intermédiaires, qui est d'ailleurs un héritage de la Révolution française, par peur aussi finalement de la démocratisation qui a aussi permis les partis, parce que les partis, il y a plein de critiques à en faire, mais ça a aussi permis la démocratisation de la vie politique, alors qu'en France pendant très longtemps, faute de partis, la vie politique est restée dans le main de notables qui étaient les seuls à pouvoir financer des campagnes et, euh, et, et donc euh, se, se, se porter candidat euh, et, et ensuite avoir une vie politique et pas non plus d'indemnité parlementaire. Donc il euh, n'y a pas de parti sous la Révolution française. Euh, les fameux Girondins et, Jacques, et, et Montagnards, quand on regarde dans le détail, il euh, y a un petit groupe euh, qui, euh, qui vote toujours de la même façon, mais sinon la plupart peuvent voter d'un côté ou de l'autre. Enfin, Ce n'est pas du tout structuré. Il n'y a aucune structure pérenne, il n'y a aucune obligation, d'ailleurs aucune obligation de vote, il euh, n'y a, y a, y a, y a pas d'argent en jeu hein, là-dedans, il n'y a pas de carte. En fait, il va falloir attendre la loi de 1901 en France, donc on est quand même plus de 100 ans après la Révolution française, pour que l'on autorise le droit d'association qui va permettre de donner vraiment naissance aux partis politiques. Et on considère qu'en France, le premier parti politique moderne, c'est le parti radical, radical socialiste, qui naît juste après la loi de 1901, et ensuite la SFIO, Section Française de l'International Ouvrière, qui naît en 1905. Mais à moins, il n'y a pas de parti en France. Il y a des agrégations d'élus ou de postulants à l'élection, il y a des groupes de pression, il y a des journaux qui vont soutenir certaines idées politiques ou autres. Donc il y a des forces politiques, mais il n'y a pas de parti au sens, au sens moderne. Donc la révolution, n a, n a, là, n'a rien à faire là-dedans, pour moi. Ok. So, um, Simon, what Simon Weiss says in her note about abolition of parties, uh, in terms of critiques, are very legitimate in the context of the 20s. But uh, according to Martin Darer, uh, her analyse, uh, so Simone Weil's analysis of the role of the French Revolution um, to the constitution of parties is uh, not right, because we cannot legitimately say that there is a professional, uh, well, it's getting professional political life under the French Republic, because actually there has no political parties before the 20th century. 
So during one mm. more than one century, there are no real political parties. There are some clubs, some groups of ideas, but it's more circumstantial. And France is really beyond, um, behind um, uh, the Anglo, uh, Anglo-Saxon world um, about political parties because uh, there was a fear of the emergence of political parties that are a way to then lead to a democratization of the political life, while otherwise right. it's more in the hands of not, not tables. Yeah, no tables. Um, and that's why it's just after 1901 that in France, after the law of 1901, that uh, political parties are um, authorized and become legal. And from then, there has been the emergence of political parties and strong ones. But before that, there was just groups of pressure, some newspapers, some aggregated forces, but not the logic of parties with the logic of votes with the logic of money uh and then the final thing i'd like to ask you and again thank you so much for being with us uh, is what what else does the world look the world celebrates uh the french revolution in such an odd way you know a very fetishistic way uh what is it that you think that the you know, huge generalization, but what does the world get wrong when we look at it from outside France and we and we think about this event obsessively the way that people do? Je viens que tu Clément. Ok, donc la question d'Aaron, c'est, euh, lui, il a la perception qu'à l'international, les gens, quand ils parlent de la Révolution française et du Bastille Day, ils sont très fétichistes euh, et du coup, euh, et qui sont sur un truc où ils ont un objet, mais ils l'utilisent euh, un peu comme un gimmick sans forcément l'avoir compris. D'après vous, euh, qu'est-ce que les étrangers, euh, le monde international, ne comprend pas quand ils parlent de la Révolution française Oula, plein de choses, hein, mais euh, il mais, n'y euh, a pas que le monde étranger qui ne comprend pas. Une grande majorité des Français ne comprend pas grand-chose à la Révolution française, donc, euh, parce, que, parce qu'elle est extrêmement complexe. Euh, je pense que déjà, l'erreur que l'on fait est de ne pas voir euh, finalement la, la, la profonde complexité de la Révolution et notamment euh, la différence entre euh, sa phase libérale, enfin ses deux phases libérales, c'est-à-dire 89-93 euh, dans un premier temps et puis ensuite le directoire, et sa phase euh, euh, interne qui est démocratique et sociale, euh, que l'on a toujours tendance à ne pas voir comme un moment de République démocratique et sociale, mais... Euh, à analyser uniquement euh, au prisme de la violence, de la guillotine, du rasoir national, euh, de Robespierre, le bourreau, etc. Mais ce qui fait que si on demande, même si on demande à des Français euh, qu'est-ce que c'est que 93 pour eux, euh, ils répondent, voilà, guillotine, euh, Robespierre, euh, c'est horrible. Et, et quand on leur dit, euh, oui, mais le maximum, vous en avez entendu parler, ils connaissent pas le maximum. Le fait que euh, l'abolition de l'esclavage euh, ne date pas du tout de 89, hein, mais date de 94, la plupart des gens ne le pensent pas. Les gens pensent que l'abolition de l'esclavage, c'est 89. Non, c'est 94. Donc, en fait, c'est ce, ce moment qui, qui, est, qui est la cible de tout le discours libéral et que, qu'on retrouve aujourd'hui encore, et c'est, on revient à la question première, hein, qu'est-ce qui est en jeu dans, dans le discours sur la Révolution française Ce qui est en jeu, c'est, c'est les conflits actuels entre ce qu'il reste du libéralisme et ce qui reste de la, de la République démocratique et sociale le, le, cette, cette partie-là n'est absolument pas connue. Euh, la, la dimension populaire de la Révolution française est aussi mal comprise. La, la dimension populaire est associée à nouveau uniquement à la violence, euh, sans qu'on réfléchisse à tout ce que cela implique euh, de participation du peuple, euh, d'exercice d'une souveraineté populaire réelle, de réflexion sur les modes euh, d'exercice et d'institutionnalisation de cette souveraineté populaire. Donc, euh, donc de toute façon... Euh, c'est tellement compliqué la Révolution française que, euh, que euh, mal connue, euh, elle ne peut être que schématisée et instrumentalisée euh, euh, souvent au, au, au mépris de ce qu'elle a été. Quand on parle, enfin voilà, on associe toujours la Révolution à la violence, euh, alors que c'est marrant quand on parle de la colonisation, c'est pas la première association, association qu'on fait. Euh, alors que la colonisation a été euh, euh, tout aussi violente. Enfin, et c'est... Mais voilà, il y, y a une lecture qui s'est imposée, qui est une lecture libérale, hein, euh, et qui s'est imposée euh, dans le roman national, donc euh, dans plus dans ce qui se passe à l'école et, et, et que l'on retrouve le plus souvent dans les médias, c'est euh, « Révolution égale tête coupée 
Euh, non, en fait, c'est autrement plus compliqué. La violence se trouve ailleurs. Le, le, et, et il faut toujours, en permanence, déconstruire cette association délétère qui a surtout pour but, en fait, d'abord, de ne pas parler de la violence d'autres moments, comme la colonisation, mais, euh, mais il y a eu tout un tas de travaux qui montrent que euh, bah, la voix anglaise, qui est censée être plus réformiste et plus douce, euh, dit aux Irlandais qu'il n'y a pas de violence. Hein. <rire> On va en discuter avec eux. Ils en ont suffisamment euh, ils en ont souffert. Et, euh, et, et d'autre part, surtout de ne jamais euh, parler de cette période 93-94, qui certes est un moment de violence politique, il ne s'agit pas de l'oublier et de le nier, elle est réelle, mais qui est aussi un moment euh, de république démocratique et sociale, comme la France n'en reconnaîtra que quelques mois en 1848 et 72 jours en 1871. Finalement, il faudra attendre euh, le début du, 19e, du 20e siècle, hein, en conséquence de la perte Dreyfus et euh, le, le Front populaire et après euh, la suite de la Seconde Guerre mondiale, pour qu'on ait à nouveau une république démocratique et sociale en France. Et ça, ça c'est très très peu connu des gens. C'est passionnant. Je suis tellement heureux de vous, trans euh, vous traduire. Uh, so, um, I'm going to make it uh, dance. Uh, it's not only yeah, yeah. Uh, the international world that uh, that doesn't understand the French Revolution. French people themselves barely understand their own revolution because it's a way too complex uh, moment of history with several phases. Uh, the first one, which is the liberal phase, which is from 89 to 93. Uh, and then the more social phase from 1903 to 94, and um, which is mostly um, focused in a, in a violence perspective with Robespierre, the guillotine, and head right. cut. Um, the fact that, and it's, it's questionable, because for example, um, this time of the revolution, so the second phase, brought very important social progress as the abolition of slavery, is from 1794 and not from 1789. And this is uh, highly exactly. um, underknown. And the fact that this second moment, this second phase, which is uh, framed as a violence one uh, of the revolution is criticized is because of the leadership of the hegemony of the liberal uh, speech. When we say liberal is basically, barely, uh, basically the right. I know in France, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and it's all. It comes back to the first question about what is important: is it freedom or is it equality? Liberalism facing social issues. Um, the popular dimension also of the revolution is very unknown, and we associate usually the people with the violence, while actually it's about sovereignty, popular sovereignty, expression mm -hmm. of the people, and way of uh, government which emerged at the time. And in a way to explain how it's, it's kind of a very uh, way too simple to associate the revolution with only violence. When you talk about colonization, the first association is not violence, while it's a highly violent uh, phase of the human history. So it's, it's, um, this is an example of the fact that history, in the way we talk about it right now, is more a national novel than a history book. Um, and uh, what else? Yeah, uh, basically, yeah, last point. The second phase of revolution was indeed very violent, but in its democratic and social aspects, it's a very um, a strong time of France. And uh, this uh, level of democracy and social progress uh, well, would not be reached before an 1871 and after World War II for most of the progress we know. I think you lay it out. And finally, this is the last show of the second season of the committee program, but we will have some kind of update to let you know what to expect when you are not expecting your committee program. Thank you, as always, for being with us, uh, wherever it is outside Pisa that we are working hard, as we always do, because democracy is our day job. It's the end of our broadcast day. Thanks for listening.
This was the 22nd program in our second series. For more global infotainment from the committee program click on the video screen right or screen left. Please like and subscribe to the committee program on Sundays at 4 p.m. Eastern and 10 p.m. 